I just got back from Infocom with the Pro Sound Web crew down in Orlando, Florida, and we have tons of stuff to share with you in coming videos. But I want to start with a really special opportunity I had to talk one on one with James Staffo about the future of the RF spectrum. James founded Professional Wireless Systems and has worked as a frequency coordinator for many A list events, including the World Cup, multiple NBA All Star games, the NBA Finals, and Rose Bowl games. He's handled RF on 14 consecutive Super Bowls, numerous Latin and English Grammy Awards every Latin and English Billboard Music Award since the year 2000, the VMAs, the Soul Train Awards, the Country Music Awards, and many more. So let's get to it. It is a real privilege to welcome to the channel Mr. James Staffo. All right, so the reason we're here is because the FCC just completed yet another auction of multiple hundreds of megahertz of spectrum over the last 10 years or so. And when that happened in, in uh, 2010, I would give these discussions and I'd start it by saying the next three years or next five years will present greater challenges to the wireless microphone and intercom user than any period in the history of man-made radio on this planet. And then at the 600 meg auction I change that to the next three years will present greater challenges. Well right now as to today I'm saying we are here. We're doing it. There is no in three years, in five years. We are in the midst of the greatest spectral auction in the history of man-made radio. It started about two years ago. Uh, the 600 megahertz and above spectrum was auctioned off by the government, by the FCC. T-Mobile was the big winner. They invested $8 billion in a couple of chunks of spectrum throughout the entire country. Their uh, investors, their stockholders and shareholders are um, pretty much demanding that T-Mobile begin to recoup on this investment. And in the last two years, they fired up in over 3,000 counties across the U.S. Before the end of this year, they'll be, they'll be energized in over 10,000 counties in the United States. Essentially, the whole country will be full of uh, T-Mobile phones up above TV37, which is 608 meg. With that move, we've lost 90% of the spectrum that we've had since 1962 to operate wireless microphones and intercoms. Because not only do we lose the spectrum above 608 meg, but all of the TV stations that were above 608 meg have to migrate down to 470 to 600 meg, right where we operate all our mics and comms now. We're in the process of doing that, and that's why um, everybody in most of the major cities is starting to take major hits uh, on wireless and have to re-coordinate, potentially buy new gear. <clears throat> so I have a little... PowerPoint here. So what you're seeing is out of this entire space where television uh, stations worked in coordination with wireless microphone and intercom operators to share TV channels 5 through at the time 69, we've essentially lost the entire right side of that screen. So right off the bat we've lost 50% of the radio spectrum we've had since 1962. In addition to that, all of these TV stations had to migrate down into the upper UH band, UHF band. Now, fortunately, only 13 TV stations in the entire country migrated down into high band VHF. High band VHF continues to remain very usable. There's lots of professional wireless products that are now being introduced in TV channels 7 through 13 because uh, it's a great band to be in. In fact, when I got into this industry, that's all there was was VHF. Uh, and then I saw in about 91, 92, I started to see UHF become more and more prevalent and finally now we find ourselves in a situation where um, VHF is completely emptied up and that's why we're able to fit systems like the Shure VHF, the Electrosonics VHF IFBs and the Radioactive Designs belt packs. Everybody's goal in the professional wireless manufacturing industry right now is spectral efficiency. We have to find ways to do our shows because I just did the Country Music Award show last week. I still had to make 150 mics and, and another 50 uh, comm systems. So there were 200 wireless audio devices, but I had half the spectrum to do it. So luckily, uh, the technology has had to evolve with this demand for spectrum and uh, in addition to the auctioned off spectrum. So just since 2000, 2010, we've lost 108 megahertz. So that's uh, everything above uh, 698. That re represents one third of the spectrum that we lost. 
And then just two years ago, we lost everything above 608 megahertz to that spectrum. So just in the last few years, we've lost over 100, uh, 200 megahertz of radial spectrum. Again, VHF survived that auction, and that's why so many manufacturers, Radioactive Designs, Electrosonics, Shure, just to name a couple, are taking advantage of that very usable open spectrum. Okay, so essentially, just like I said, since T-Mobile has uh, began to energize in the spectrum that they purchased, by the end of this year, they'll be operating in 10,000 counties. When that happens, it becomes illegal to operate a wireless microphone or intercom because T-Mobile now owns that band. We don't. So the fine, if you create interference onto T-Mobile's network, is $10,000 per day per frequency. So like one production might get slammed with a quarter of a million dollar fine if they crash the um, T-Mobile's uh, you know, uh, subscriber network. It's also illegal to, to manufacture wireless microphones in those auctioned off bands. So as of right now, anybody who built equipment that goes up to 698, they have to redesign or at least update the firmware to stay below 608 meg, except for two guard bands, and you're limited to 20, watts of uh, 20 milliwatts of power, and that is um, 614 to 16, which is above TV 37, and 652 to 653, which is a guard band between the cell phone uplink and the cell phone downlink. So here's what's happening. This is courtesy of Joe Chowdelli at Sennheiser. Thanks, Joe, again, for letting us uh, use this. You'll notice that this goes up to 698. What's happening now is post-auction. We begin to see the top is what we've had, the bottom is where we're going. So we lose a couple of chunks of spectrum above 698, and all of the TV stations up there move down to uh, high, uh, low band UHF. As again, VHF remained relatively untouched because digital TV doesn't propagate well in VHF. So it was a gamble on our part to design the system, but it was an educated gamble because we knew that digital TV would lose probably 40% of their subscribers by changing to VHF. So most of the TV moved to low band uh, UHF, channel 14 through 37. There's your uplink and downlink for the for the uh, T-Mobile subscribers and other uses. There's your um, there's your duplex gap, 652 to 663. It's 11 meg of completely legal spectrum for wireless mics. And then here's our sliver of 2 meg above TV 37. And other than that, we're very limited in most cities in the United States in UHF. Here's what Orlando's gonna look like by July 2020. And as you can see, you only have two UHF channels open for Disney World to operate 1,500 wireless microphones on one property. VHF is relatively untouched. All the green is, is go green. VHF is pretty much uh, untouched. You could operate probably over 200 wireless belt packs with the radioactive design unit in those open TV stations. And here's just a quick history. This is from uh, you know, 20 years ago before the auctions, it was just analog TV and a bunch of wireless microphones we can get in there. Then we had digital TV light off in parallel with, an with analog, so we had a little less room for wireless mics. Then analog shut off, but we had a 700 megs auction, and now we find ourselves with less spectrum than ever because there's the 600 and 700 meg auction are complete. We've chose to become completely spectrally efficient, so we, we use an amplitude modulated signal as opposed to digital or, um, or frequency modulation. We could fit literally 30 times as many uh, systems as one FM system or digital system because we're so spectrally efficient. That's why we designed the radioactive design system. Uh, my partner uh, works on large special events. I work on large special events, and Jeff, our uh, other partners in charge of over a thousand wireless mics in a three block radius on Broadway and we all have been to the FCC speaking on behalf of the production community and we saw what was coming down the pike we said if we don't design something we won't be able to do our own shows so now when you go out on a show you'll see lots of radioactive design comms and then you'll see um, one of the various uh, digital comms that are in, went up in spectrum rather than down as we chose to do so that's what uh, just a couple of meg of spectrum looks like on a typical show. Uh, this is a DTV station here. The rest is um, uh, wireless uh, in-ears and uh, comm systems. Again, we have to play all the tricks in the world, including uh, trying to separate our wireless mics by putting them in metal trays so they don't radiate third order harmonics and step on top of your own wireless receivers. This is the difference between the microphones being in the tray 
and when you take them out of the tray, those same microphones increase the noise floor so high that it makes uh, wireless mic receivers unusable. There's some differences between analog systems and the DEC 1.9 gig systems. The reason why we chose analog, everybody thought, you know, digital is in vogue, let's all go digital. Well, we didn't go with that because analog has a lot of advantages. A, you could coordinate the frequencies, you can license it, and you can um, have priority over other people coming into the venue. If you have interference, you could tune around it, just like a car radio. If you want to change channels, you turn a knob. Same thing with uh, the RAD uh, wireless intercom unit. Digital systems have some really cool perks. They can do point-to-point -point and lots of audio routing. However, they're in an unlicensed, uncoordinated consumer band so that only one of these systems could operate in the same area at the same time. If anyone else, including a consumer in the audience, comes in, or Sennheiser also makes a deck ENG mic, if one of those or a couple of those come in, you will literally crash all of the systems at 1.9 gig. They're not coordinatable. It's called the deck band. It was invented for cordless telephones. So essentially, the companies, Riedel, FreeSpeak, um, uh, Telex, uh, RTS, and Coachcom, they're using a band that, again, uh, it's shared. It's, a, it's a, essentially a consumer band for professional application. If you're in a controlled environment, like a studio that you can protect who comes in, you'll be very protected and usable. If you're at a large event where there's eight different entities in the same area, you can only have one of these devices, systems I should say, operating in that environment. You cannot coordinate two of those devices uh, in the same area in the same 1.9 gig deck band. So it's going to take a lot of spectrum band planning to make these events work, to make any production work. I recommend spreading the freaks out as much as possible. IFBs down in the 72 meg, um, RAD comms in the VHF, high, high VHF band. What's left of the traditional UHF band is where all your microphones and in-ears are going to go. And of course you could take advantage of other spectrum. The 902 to 928 again is a non-coordinated band but it could be usable. The FCC just opened up 941 to 960. That's a brand new band. Um, a couple of companies are introducing product there, Electrosonics. We may put RAD bases up there, we're not sure yet. 1.4 gig, new band also uh, available. It's coordinated by Aftrack, which is an aeronautical testing uh, uh, company. 1.9 gig is that, that deck band. It's uncoordinatable, but if you can get it in, in a usable way, there's some pretty cool features on this decked equipment that you just simply can't do with analog. Of course, 2.4 gig, but you're sharing with Wi-Fi, so that's a risk. And then the new one is 6.5 gig. Uh, Alteros is the newest company that produces a, the first and only wireless I'm aware of in the 6.5 gig uh, frequency band. Thank you again so much, James, for sharing your incredible wealth of knowledge and experience. I'm sure there's going to be folks with questions who are eager for more information. I will link to his site below at RadioactiveRF.com, where they have lots of info along with upcoming events listed. If you have a question you think others would benefit from hearing the answer to, leave it in the comments below. If there are enough questions, we'll see if we can get James on for a video call to answer them all at once. If you haven't seen the before, be sure to check out all of Radioactive Design's intercom, wireless antenna, low-loss coax, and other RF gear while you're at RadioactiveRF.com. Thanks to ProSoundWeb for making the trip to Infocom possible this year. There's lots more to share in the coming videos. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.